this spring, we started to work this field. And our challenge was to go from that thick clover that we've had down now for over a year to something that wouldn't be too competitive with our vegetables. Even though our clover is adding nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and other micronutrients, it's also taking nutrients away and taking water away and competing for space with the crop. So how do we balance the benefits of our living mulch with its competitiveness with the crop? And what we decided to do was to test a minimum till and a no-till. So over here we have some of the minimum till plots. We have broccoli rows and we have cabbage and broccoli and then we have some Brussels sprouts. The cabbage and the broccoli rows, we came in and made three foot beds. We had a primary tillage piece of equipment. We had a single shank chisel plow that I put on the back of the tractor and I went up one way and down the others. And we basically just disturbed the clover. And then we went through and took a three foot tiller and tilled it lightly. And when we got the clover basically turned over and killed back, but not entirely killed back, then we came in with our mechanical transplanter and we transplanted broccoli and cabbage and Brussels sprouts. And as you can see, three months later, we have the clover moving back into the rows where we did the minimal tillage. And the good thing about that is that, number one, we're covering the soil so we're keeping other weeds out. Number two, we're going to be providing a continuous supply of the nutrients that our living mulch will will supply particularly nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and the most important thing perhaps is that it's providing habitat for beneficial insects we find that there are pollinator insects lots of bees there are beneficial predators and parasites we have uh, parasitic wasps that are uh, here and in fact we have seen very very high parasitism rates on many of the crops early in April we were seeing almost a one-to-one -one ratio of parasitized aphids to live aphids so our parasitic wasps have been very very active and one of the reasons they've been very active is that they have this habitat as a pollen and nectar source and as a source to cover the ground. Our beneficial insects, particularly things like spiders and ground beetles, find bare soil that you normally find in production vegetables to be like a desert. There's not enough habitat for them to flourish and so they don't. And in this system we have very large numbers of all beneficial insects, pollinators, parasites, and predators. The broccoli had a very, very high yield, and the other nice thing that we found was that when the temperatures got to be hot in June, the living mulch cooled the broccoli down and we had a nice crop. Even when the temperatures were soaring into the 90s, the broccoli didn't bolt, we were able to pick a nice crop. Same thing with the cabbage. Again, we had, we had an unusually hot July, and the cabbage is starting to head up and looking very nice. Not only did we want to try minimum tillage, but because we were feeling so confident with our green manure that has now become a living mulch here in, in this field, we decided to try absolutely no till, which has been a challenge to try and figure out. So really the competition is much greater here in the Brussels sprouts. We chose Brussels sprouts for our no-till experiment because they're a very aggressive plant and we thought they might be able to compete with all of this clover. So what we did in this plot is instead of come through and till beds at all, we just took the clover that was here and we went through and mowed it down as short as we could. Then we went through and used our flamer, our propane flamer, our infrared flamer, and we burned back the clover 
so that at least the top portion was killed back. The roots clearly did not die. As you can see, these clover plants are very healthy. Despite the burned back appearance of clover plants after flaming, regrowth was quite rapid. So we raked the clover to disturb it immediately before transplanting. The raking process set the clover back and exposed some bare soil. Immediately after raking, we transplanted Brussels sprouts plants. We did set the clover back enough that we could put the Brussels sprouts in with the transplanter. Once we transplanted the Brussels sprouts, we came through several times and flamed around the, the young Brussels sprout plants so that we keep the clover set back for as long as we could. And then we have continued throughout the season to mow around the Brussels sprouts in between the rows where we could. As you can see, because we did not till at all in this bed, the clover has been quite aggressive and has come back readily. Red clover might not have been the best choice for this because it grows so tall and so vigorously. Fortunately though, the Brussels sprouts plants around the middle of July started getting to the point where they were taller than the clover and now it looks like they're going to have a very nice crop of Brussels sprouts. However, what we did find that we hadn't anticipated in this block is that because there's so much cover, places for both our beneficial insects to hide and other living things that we had voles. A lot of voles moved into this plot and we did have voles injuring the young plant so we lost some of the Brussels sprout plants and the row itself is not as thick as a normal commercial crop would be. We did not have that problem in the broccoli and the cabbage where we did the initial minimum tillage, but here where we did the absolute no-till, we did have more vole problems. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permies.com. Uh, you've forgotten something. Come to my website, <laughs> veganicpermaculture.com. Okay, okay, all right, we got that in there. Um, but, but, you know, Come on out to the forums at permies.com. We... Veganicpermaculture.com. <laughs> where we talk about living mulches, homesteading, and permaculture all the time. Mm -hmm.